no connection at all between the boss and your grandmother, I would hope. No. <laughs> Unless your grandmother was, like, really cool and, and, and owned a criminal empire. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris discuss how and why games are able to make the audience care about fictional characters. Plus, further impressions of Persona 5, the return of Mystery Science Theater 3000, and more. BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 99 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, Games and New Media with a Splash of Academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Good morning, afternoon, or night, internet. And we're joined by Doc. Just a second, I need to move these uh, 99 red balloons out of the way. Hmm. We got an interesting uh, media topic of discussion for you today. It's about um, caring about characters. Why is it that we, uh, when we read a story or watch a movie or something like that, um, why is it that we care about how it ends? Or if it doesn't end quite the way we want or something happens to the characters, why does this affect us in any way if they're all just figments of someone's imagination that they wrote down? And don't don't go anywhere because we're actually going to be talking about this in the vein of video games. Yes. Yeah, I, I don't care about this topic at all. <laughs> oh, see what I did there? Yes. Yeah. Also, hi, everybody. <laughs> um, but first, we have some opening segments for you, including the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. Okay, well, I know that uh, at least these past couple of weeks, both Chris and I have been playing a lot of Persona 5. Mm-hmm. Uh, came out recently. Pretty popular game. I believe it has already surpassed over a million sales. Now, this is the life simulator, in the right? US. Where you can ignore your real friends to get imaginary friends? Yes. Okay, got it. In fact, I almost <laughs> didn't come today just to play more of it. Ah, but well, that would have been... Uh, yeah, that, that would have been excusable, I think, within the context <laughs> of the, the meta of the game. Well, I figured that uh, I was... I actually would have this inclination that you know our bond might grow a little bit deeper, and I wanted to get to the next rank, so I thought I'd better come out today <laughs> so I get to the next rank and get some sort of an extra bonus. This is really all. So, still, so what, what he's saying still, though is, if like the bond wasn't about to advance, you probably just ignore us and exactly like, take advantage of his day off to do extra training. Right. So the real point here is, do I get a new ability or not? No, I get all the new abilities. Well, you what, just you what just am I grant them to me. Just to grant them to me. Oh, your your influence awakens something within him. Well, sorry, my my special ability is cynicism, and I think you're already maxed out on this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so speaking of, and, and to talk a little bit about what Persona Five is, or the Persona series, for those that don't know, um, it's essentially a spinoff of the Shin Megami Tensei series. Essentially, the that series was about, um, well demons and, and, and other supernatural creatures that you would that you would slay in a, a Japanese RPG. Uh, the Persona series being a spinoff is about sort of balancing that element of either investigating the supernatural or hunting the supernatural or what have you with the life of a Japanese high school student and their relationships with people um, in their life, like their their peers that are their friends or some sort of adult adult role models or guardians, uh, teachers, etc. So you're kind of having to balance um, your social statistics with your, um, well, your RPG statistics of a persona. And the personas are essentially demons, kind of, not really. They're sort of like, uh, how do they describe them, Chris? So mechanically it works a lot like SMT does, but Mm -hmm. the explanation behind them is that they're basing the series aesthetically on Jungian psychology. The the idea is that your persona, um, and they also have kind of the counter to your persona's uh, shadows, mm-hmm. are aspects of your mind or someone else's mind that um, manifest in this cognitive world that you go into. Um, so your persona is actually more of an, an embodiment of something that's within yourself as opposed to literally yourself, if and that it, makes and, sense. And the theme of, of this, one, this game in particular um, is masks and sort of like hiding who you actually are and um, once once you sort of come to terms with who you are and accept it, then you're able to remove your mask, and they do it in a kind of this 
uh, sort of a gory scene, especially mm-hmm. early on, where you literally have a mask covering your face, and you reach up and you rip it off, and there's like, you know... It, it's part of your face, part of your face, so, so the blood's coming off. But when you do that, um, this sort of triggers that awakening where you recognize, okay... Um, you accept who you are, and therefore you're, you gain all the powers of your persona, and you form a, a contract with your persona, basically. Mm-hmm. So, but speaking of the game, I know I know I've played quite a bit. I've, I'm I'm, a, I'm just through the fourth palace, mm-hmm. and I'm at about the 62 hour mark or so, mm-hmm. and I feel like I'm still only about halfway through because I'm only in August. The game runs like a calendar, kind of real time, and mm-hmm. every day you have to balance what you do. Um, and Chris, how far are you? I'm almost done with the second palace. Almost done. <laughs> so you so you're probably you you've probably played at least 20 hours then. Probably yeah. yeah. So I feel like we're definitely qualified to talk about the game and, and raise any criticisms. For me, one of the biggest points that I think is is really frustrating. Um, anytime you have like big plans the next day, you are unable to do anything else. Like you can't. You can only go to sleep. Mm-hmm. You can't. You can't. You know. You can't lift weights. You can't uh, play a video game inside. You can play a video game in the game, by the way. Um, you can't read a book. You can't, you know, etc. In other words, you can't do things that can raise your social stats, mm-hmm. which is very frustrating because there's no reason why you shouldn't do it. It's like this weird concept of, well, you have a big day tomorrow. You shouldn't. This literally said to you, you have a big day tomorrow. You really should just get some sleep. And mm-hmm. I literally. As opposed to literally doing like ten pull ups mm-hmm. to get like a few extra points in HP, mm-hmm. like really doing ten pull ups is going to prevent me from having an okay day, or like reading reading a reading a chapter in a book is going to prevent me from doing what I'm going to do next day. Mm-hmm. It's just weird disconnect that I that I don't understand why they do it, and, and it continues to happen yeah. over and over and over again throughout the game. It, it never I feel really like I feel like probably the biggest reason is balancing. They probably calculated how many days they wanted you to be able to have free, or specifically how many slots. Because oh, I'm sure that's part of on it. A, yeah. On a given day, there's like the after school slot, the evening slot. Um, do they ever give you like the night slot after evening, or is evening just night? Evening, evening equals night, and okay. that's another criticism that I have too. Is mm-hmm. that when you're when you have a Sunday or during the summer? I'm actually in the summer right now, mm-hmm. so there's no school for a period of about a month, which is which is great. Um, and I would think, oh, great, I get a whole extra part of my day, right, for sure, to do things. Nope, it's, it's just, just daytime. It's just daytime evening. and evening. Still, mm-hmm. just like and just and in school, it was after school and evening doesn't make any sense. I should be able to do at least one extra task because I don't have school, mm-hmm. which is why they should have added an extra mechanic where you could skip school and have an extra an extra <laughs> part of your day to work. Play, play the truancy but game. Yeah. the negative is, <laughs> right, bully. because you're actually on parole as part of your character. Mm-hmm. So and if so you get expelled, you're... You could get expelled. Yeah. Wow, that really is bully. <laughs> yeah. So it's, but, but bully, I think, handled that a little bit better. Yeah, she had a lot more free, freedom in terms of when you went to school and not. This game pretty much controls, okay, it's a school day, you have to go to school. And I do feel like that's kind of a Japanese mm-hmm. cultural thing, wouldn't you say? Quite possibly, yeah. Um, I, I mean, you also, for example, go to school Monday through Saturday. So you only right. get one day off a week. Right. So, um, And I, I did think that was, that was pretty interesting where they give you your, um, what is your current quest? They have it kind of up in the corner. Mm-hmm. And I, I had a, kind of had a laugh out loud when I saw one of, right after you get through part of the palace, your, your, um, your quest was, was it a be an obedient student or what was it? Like, uh, like live, live an honest live a, student life. An honest student yeah. life, yeah. Like, <laughs> this is... This is the most Japanese quest well, that I think I've ever seen. What's interesting, seen. though, is it's, it's, it's themed very specifically, though, for the themes of the game. Which oh, totally. Is that you're, you're sort of breaking the rules of society to help change or fix mm-hmm. what's wrong with society. Mm-hmm. And so at the beginning, they're kind of like, you know, sort of almost, it reminds me a little bit of 1984. It's like falling in line, be the good citizen that everyone expects you to be, and then you start to rebel a little bit. Booker's a good the cop. Whole pulling the mask <laughs> off comes from. And they do touch on several... Um, Controversial subjects, I suppose. I mean, the very first person that you go against um, has been sexually harassing one of the students, and it is heavily implied that he actually raped one of his students as well. They don't actually flatly say that, but it is heavily implied. I assume they don't say it, by the way, because of probably certain countries. They would ha- they would it would it increase would the rating, rating above yeah. M. It's already mm-hmm. rated M. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure they don't want to do that, um, but it is heavily implied. And if, and so one of the things that you're doing in this game is instead of going in and killing the bad guys in their palaces, you're actually trying to um, steal their heart in a sort of an, ab- an abstract sense, but in that world, it's a literal sense. And steal you take their, their, um, their treasure. Their corrupted desires, basically. Right. And so when you do that, they basically have this epiphany and they realize, oh, now I understand what I did was wrong, and they essentially turn themselves in. Interesting. Yeah. So you just shoot them with an empathy ray, it'd have the same effect. 
<laughs> well, we don't have empathy rays. And, we don't have empathy rays. Well, that seems like a design flaw to me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, they did do some changes from some of the earlier games in the series, and, and I think you talked a little bit about this last time, where mm-hmm. the, the palaces that you run through, essentially the dungeons, are actually designed. Like, each mm-hmm. floor is, is designed. There's, like, little puzzles within each dungeon. It's not just a flat dungeon crawl like it used to be. Mm-hmm. What do you think about that? I like it a lot better, actually. And um, I mentioned last time I talked about it that it really does feel like you're progressing through an actual place and not just, like, this this vague sort of procedurally generated series of floors. Which, which I did want to mention, they still do have the vague procedurally <laughs> yes. generated floors um, in a sort of an optional dungeon space known as mementos. Mm-hmm. The idea in, in there is that uh, people have palaces that um, some people have palaces that are basically completely wrapped up in their own desires and overwhelmed, but everyone has you know some other sense of themselves and some shadow self or what have you, mm-hmm. and those are not not big enough to have a palace, but they they all have to reside somewhere, and they reside in this sort of essentially the collective unconscious, which is mementos. Mm-hmm. And is it a fresh maker? It is a fresh maker. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That, that's a mentos meme, by the uh, way. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Um, <laughs> but that one is a procedural, procedurally generated dungeon, mm-hmm. um, which I, which I don't know how far you've gotten into it. I've gotten pretty far, I think, mm-hmm. and I found I do actually kind of enjoy running through that as kind of a change of pace yeah. because it's very, it's very straightforward. It is, it is a complete dungeon crawl. Mm-hmm. Um, there's treasure to find, but it's, it's ne- nothing's ever in the same place. Mm-hmm. The other thing that's interesting about it, too, is that, you know, what happened to me in Persona 4 was I would very quickly get through each um, main dungeon, Mm -hmm. and then there's the span of, like, you know, a couple of weeks when you're just waiting for that deadline that you had, but you don't have to rush anymore because you've already finished, Um, which is nice because you have this free time to help build up your stats, but you're also um, not doing any actual dungeon crawling, whereas here this gives you an option, like, hey, I could actually go into the unconscious world Mm -hmm. and do some dungeon crawling either to level up or to do side quests, um, and it's also that constant temptation away from, like, well, do I want to work tonight or do I want to go into the other world? Because I know that if I go into the other world, if I might have had two slots to do stuff before, like, this one slot basically invalidates my chance to do anything in the evening. Mm-hmm. So it's always very costly to go in there, but it's also the only way to level yourself up in a practical sense. I, I will say that that's, that's true until you raise... Um Kawakami's level high enough, and mm. then you can actually still do something in the evening when you get that. Oh, cool! Very cool. So it's like I, that's I, that's I a big it's improvement. Like seven, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's huge, but it's kind of hard to to get her high enough. Mm-hmm. Um, is that something you think is worth talking about? The fact that because I've heard a little bit of criticism where, for example, her character Kawakami is your teacher, mm. and uh, she works for a maid service. I don't know if you. I haven't gotten that far. Okay, so um, at a certain point, um, you can essentially accidentally expose her as a not. You're not exposing her. You just find out that mm-hmm. she works for a maid service. Mm-hmm. Your homeroom teacher? Yeah, your homeroom yeah. teacher. And uh, she, because her sister needs money, she's been working as a, for this, like, um, frilly maid service where mm-hmm. it's basically like a Japanese men would mm-hmm. call them up to have them come by and, like, wear, like, a short skirt mm-hmm. and, like, clean their place so they can watch them in a maid uniform, basically. Mm-hmm. Kind of like a, um, it's kind of that not, not so weird, much prostitution, fantasy, but, but, like, this weird kind of, like, mm-hmm. You're almost there, but you're not real. Not really. Yeah. Um, so it's this kind of weird situation where she's consistently being hired by her high school student because she needs the money, mm. and they're kind of you, you're you're becoming friends with her, you're becoming close with her, but not. But it just it it kind of feels a little weird, a little mm-hmm. strange. Yeah. And I think that's one of those things where it's kind of this um, again, almost a almost a cultural disconnect mm-hmm. because I'm sure it. It's not presented in a way that is at all, like, sexual or creepy Mm -hmm. or anything like that. But I can see how people that are not used to that might come to that conclusion. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and I think that um, even in the context of, like, you know, if you were were Japanese playing this Mm -hmm. Japanese game, you'd probably have a different sense of it than we do here in the West. Um, I I do want to point out, because mm -hmm. since you haven't met her yet, Mm -hmm. that she does call you master. Oh. And she sends you because um, I wanted to, I want to be clear why people might think it's creepy. Mm-hmm. And oh, I see. Her yeah. um, her text to you will say will will say things that are, and they do, the game does this on purpose. Mm-hmm. It, if you just read the title of the text, mm-hmm. it sounds sexually suggestive. Yeah, which is, and then you yeah. read the text and you realize, oh, it wasn't meant that way mm-hmm. at all. That's but probably the entire point, though. The it's thing. the entire point. It's all meant to be kind of a tongue in cheek mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. But I know U.S. has had this issue where there's been some teachers, mm-hmm. both male and female teachers, that have had um, illicit affairs with students. Mm-hmm. It's kind of 
it's become sort of like this media thing where, where it, it doesn't happen that often, but when it does happen, it's big news, of mm-hmm. course. So I did find it kind of um, interesting that Japan completely went there, just didn't care, and kind of turned it into this kind of almost a joke. Mm-hmm. Well, it's also like kind of not crossing a particular line, which is like mm-hmm. typically when this happens and it ends up on the news, it is because it, it does cross that line. Um, but it probably, too, even over there, it's meant to be a little bit of this uncomfortable thing, even if they don't explicitly like say, like, oh, you should feel uncomfortable about this. Um, it's probably trying to create a little bit of that feeling. And I think Persona has always kind of had that sort of tilt to it where it will present themes and will present um, stuff that in the story is meant to make you a little bit uncomfortable and to think about um, these things. Because, I mean, you know, the idea of psychology and shadows being your aesthetic, it's like kind of addressing the dark side that's inside of everyone. And so I, I think it's trying to make you think about those topics. Mm-hmm. I agree. Well, we've we've, I think, exhausted our... Persona talk for now. For now, yeah. I'm sure we'll have more talk later. I mean, this, Persona's one of those things, honestly, I could talk about for hours. <laughs> oh, I probably but, could, too. <laughs> but I'm sure. Uh, Doc, Doc is looking rather bored, so we probably... <laughs> it's cool. I got my phone. I, I'm, I'm just going ahead and uh, surfing a little bit of uh, interesting ideas about our meaty topic. Excellent. Cool. Believe it or not, we're not always playing games. Every now and then, we like to talk about the other stuff. So you may have heard about this. Um... Oh. Thanks to the glory that is Kickstarter, Mystery Science Theater 3000, The Return, is now a thing. It's officially season 11, and there are some interesting, oh, notable things about this new and, season. And Netflix, right? Yeah, Netflix. Yeah, because I, I went on and I watched in preparation for this. Um, I did watch an episode as well. I watched the first episode. Yeah, So we good. can all kind oh, of good. talk Great. about it, I think. Well, um, the, the first thing I guess we should note is that the original run had almost, but not quite, 300 canon episodes. Mm-hmm. So three episodes in, they have their 300th episode. But they're they're being a little bit, um, well, honest. We'll, we'll, just, we'll just call it honest. It'll be nice to call it honest about this. And, and one of the moments that they have is, yay, we're celebrating our 300th episode. And they're saying we're celebrating... Uh, something that we had absolutely nothing to do with. Right. Because <laughs> you know, it, it's all new. Yeah, And that's is. part of it, too. It it's really like new, new cast. Um, you know, the, the, the mad scientists um, and their helpers are all new. Yeah, Alicia, uh, Felicia Day is one of the mads, and the other one is... Pat Nussel. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, so and I, for, I, for people who aren't familiar with MSC3K, yes. do you want to explain what it is, what the format is, sure. how it came about? Okay, so Mystery Science Theater 3000 actually started in the 80s. A guy named uh, Joel Hodgkins decided that um, he was going to take sort of his comedy routine and put it into uh, live science fiction theater. In other words, play old bad movies from, you know, the 60s and and 50s and stuff Mm -hmm. and do commentary on it. And it's a lot funnier to do commentary within the context of a science fiction world. So he created a little one for for his own and two robot buddies who sit there and they, in shadow Rama, uh, make fun and, and do what are called riffs and, and very puns. very low budget too. Yeah, always extremely to low budget. The, the original MST three. I'm also uh, a longtime fan as well. Yeah. I know you are too, Doc. Yeah. Um, and Chris is our, our completely doesn't know what it is kind of guy. Well, I, impartial victim. Impartial, exactly. So, <laughs> victim. so I wanted to... I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with what it is, yeah. but yeah, um, I haven't watched much But yeah, it. originally they... It wasn't even a televised thing. They no. Would, they had uh, cassette tapes. Yeah. Cassette tapes. Videotapes. Videotapes, And yeah. they would they would encourage you at the end of each episode to keep, keep circulating, circulating the, the tapes. Because they were trying to get more yeah. recognition to eventually get their TV deal, which they did get eventually. Yeah. Now, to be fair... Even after it was TV, it still wasn't TV because it was in the old KTMA days and it was public access television. Mm-hmm. So this is how they were doing that. Um, so they had the resources of a set, and I use the term very loosely, <laughs> until then they got the deal with the Comedy Channel back when it was the Comedy Channel. And mm-hmm. in fact, I think back then it was like even called Ha um, <laughs> when it merged with Comedy Channel. And they became Comedy Central, right. and they buried season, what they call now season zero. So that's not even considered canon. The season zero stuff with with uh, Larry and uh, Clayton Forrester, it, and it's pretty raw. Too. It is very raw, yeah. Um, but the thing of it is, there's been this sort of meta story that has risen up out of it. Um, you know, I, I like the way that you said it uh, earlier, Jim. Say say it again. The 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 story behind why they shot Joel into space and, and oh, all that. Right. So so this is one of the things I enjoyed the most about the original. MST3K is mm-hmm. that they tell you 
they give you snippets of story throughout the episodes. Yes. And your introduction to it, if you've never seen an episode before, is really just all in that theme song at the start, where they just kind of say, oh, Joel was this guy, he worked in this factory, and you know, he's just some lowly factory worker. He did a really good job. Oh, but his bosses didn't like him, so they shot him into space. Right. And that's it. And that's done. Okay, mm-hmm. now the stage is set, I'm ready to watch yep. some bad movies. And I, I always loved that aspect because I felt I could relate to it because mm-hmm. it had this kind of um, this element of oh the world is unfair sometimes and you could still be you could do everything right but sometimes people just don't like you and that's they right. and they try to screw you over and you just have to make the best of it and that's what Joel does now now Jim keep in mind Joel uh, couldn't control when the movies began or end <laughs> right. because he used those special parts to create his robot friends. Mm-hmm. So um, and that was and that was another aspect of it that I thought was was pretty neat was yeah. that he could have just been by himself and he actually could have been he could have you know just stopped the movies uh-huh. but he didn't want to be alone so he created himself he created companions for himself right Which but you course, learn all that in just like one little line yeah but really they're, the they're puppets I mean they're robot puppets oh sure and, and they're being puppeteered you mean they're by not the, real robots oh no they're not real they're robots. not real robots <laughs> from the eighties yeah. <laughs> uh, but the the puppeteers and voices for the robots are the same as the mad scientists and right. and kind of traditionally always have been there's some crossover there which is interesting because then certain people left the show the robot voices were replaced other actors were replaced we we went from Doctor Ford Forrester to Pearl Forrester mm-hmm. over in the sci-fi days. And now we're at Kinga Forrester, who is the third generation, if you will, um, Pearl being her grandmother. She looks more like a, an, an adult um, Pebbles Flintstone. Actually, you're right. Or, or not Pebbles. What's, is that the Pebbles the girl? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Pebbles is the girl. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, I think that's right. She's got but a right, bone in her hair and she everything. Does, I always, she does. Yeah. Well, but, but they've got the skeleton crew, which is the band. That mm-hmm. they say. But there's a little too a little too on the nose, I think. There's some some elements that are just a little too on the nose. And and so like the long intro yeah, where they well, basically the, try to explain they they try to give you all this backstory. There was backstory. Which is funny. So you guys you guys were complaining about how long the intro was, whereas me coming into it for the first time, I had a vague sense of what the show was about, but it's like, okay, I'm sitting down for the return, they're gonna tell me like what it is that I need to know, and I didn't feel like I learned what I need to know. Right. <laughs> and maybe maybe that's the point, maybe what I need to know is not much. <laughs> yeah. Well, um that, and like I I did appreciate like the really crappy practical effects they oh, used. Oh yeah. Oh that's, that's <laughs> great. that was great, and that's kind of continuing the long standing. Yeah. Tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, I just felt that because you we really were supposed to have that feeling when you when someone first comes in MS three three K and is first introduced to it, you're supposed to just sit down. They watch an episode and they're like, "What the hell is going on?" What you is don't going really know. on? Yeah. <laughs> and fans kind of laugh along because they know because they've picked up these, uh-huh. these story snippets through watching you know, 40, 50 episodes, you mm-hmm. kind of start to piece together, oh, there's these sort of relationships are going on and this sort of thing is happening yep. because they just sort of imply and they just sort of give you little bits and pieces here and there. Uh, it's kind of like a video game. Right. Yeah. Well, for me, the, <laughs> kind of, yeah. For me, the first episode of The, of the Return, um, I didn't like that intro, mainly for, for the reason of I felt like it was trying to give you a whole bunch of story, kind of front load you, mm-hmm. almost like uh, when, when a film kind of shoves a whole bunch of exposition at you at the start and right. so just plunging you into the, into the actual story. Yeah. I didn't care about the backstory yeah. to me. I just was like, okay, um, I, want, I want him in space with the robots, and let's go. Let's just yeah. go with it. I'm resurrecting my family's experiment, and this, my sidekick, mm-hmm. is TV's son of TV's Frank, who you should just call Max, is here with me mm-hmm. down on Moon 13, but which, they, is not, right. which is legally distinct from the <laughs> Gizmonic Institute's uh, Deep 13, which is the 13th mm-hmm. floor mm-hmm. of the Gizmonic and, Institute. And we could but have they didn't even give us what? that much detail. Right. But, <laughs> but so. we, we could have figured out a lot of that stuff with little snippets of them saying that here and there throughout yeah. the little breaks, and I... I that's my. That's really my only real criticism, though. I will say because mm-hmm. I did enjoy the episode. I enjoy. I liked the riffing. I liked. Um, oh, I think the writing's been great. I thought the writing was great. And I'm sorry. The, the, is, is his name Jonah? The yeah, Jonah. Um, uh, I, the I actor's name is really Jonah Hess, job. but he chose. Uh, he chose uh, Hess Dunn, hmm. um, which I think is, is pretty great. Um, because of course, Charl, uh, Carl, Char, 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 Charleston, Charleston Heston, Charlton Heston, Charlton Heston. Yeah, uh, damn dirty apes. All those guys. <laughs> um, yeah, you know that. That's. That's the classic marooned in space character, and so it, it just harkens back to that. Um, this is the third voice for Crow. This is the third voice for Tom Servo. Those are the robots. But um, and, I, and I will always be a Kevin Murphy fan, who is the second oh, I'm voice of, of, of Tom Servo. But you know, I was never a huge fan of. Um, like the the second crow because mm. as the voices change the humor changed because they wrote sure. their own parts sure. but i really think that they what they've done is they've blended some of the old humor of both of those characters and sort of brought it out so there's a lot of um self-referential humor 
which is interesting. Uh, I think what you might be running into now is that you are now getting a show that was made by fans of the show, Mm -hmm. which I gather has never happened before. That's not – well, yeah. I mean, even within Misty fame itself, yeah, that Mm -hmm. kind of did a little bit. Mm -hmm. They they made Mm self-referential humor. And so if it wasn't there, it wouldn't feel right. Yeah, they, they all – they would have callbacks all the time. It looked, right. Once the, ser- the the seasons went on, Watch and they had more snakes. episodes. Yeah, they would they would they would just reference things that they had made that they had Puma? riffs they had made like Puma. From, yeah, yeah. From uh, like from like just many seasons ago, and like people that had been fans for a long time would get it. And everybody else they would get it. Go, no one what? else would. Mm-hmm. You got to understand. There's about 600 riffs in an episode mm-hmm. on the old stuff. Nowadays, there's about 800 riffs. So the show's gone a little ADD. Mm-hmm. They talk a little faster. They come a little quippier. They're faster. You don't have these long pauses of nothing mm-hmm. where, well, we need, to, we need to be quiet for a minute, get the audience a chance to catch up mentally mm-hmm. and, and reacquaint with the plot. No, forget it. I we understand the no medium. one's paying attention to the plot. Well, right. <laughs> we, we understand the medium now, and, and we're like, they're going to watch this again. A, a true fan is going to watch this again, and someone who's not isn't going to care about that anyway. Uh, people who don't like the show have always said, like back in the 90s, I heard people saying, I hate that show. I can't follow the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, yeah, you're missing the point. You're not right. supposed to follow the movie. Uh, but what I like about what they've done this time, now you get, get some of these references like, hey, have have we said watch out for snakes yet? Yeah, I think <laughs> we did. Oh, okay. <laughs> and that's it. So it, it it's nostalgic unto itself. It's a self-referential nostalgia, which is – Already layered upon old nostalgia, which is like, so we're talking about a 30 year old show here, uh, effectively. Yeah. But some people are only going to remember the last half of that when it was on sci fi. They're not even going to realize that this is the 10th um, season of a a show you really don't have full access to. Because there's weird legal battles that come with it. In order to riff on a movie like that, you have to own the movie. Mm -hmm. So every movie that's ever been done, they bought Hmm. whoever they was at the time. So Comedy Central owned all of those for the early ones. Then Sci-Fi owned all of those. And that's why Sci-Fi never showed all the any of the old Comedy Central stuff. Mm-hmm. Joel actually owns the license to Gizmonic. So until he came back on to this season 11, we haven't heard about uh, Gizmonic since like season 5. So one of the very first jokes that we get is um, Crow looks over at Jonah and says, you're not my real father. <laughs> Which in yeah. and of itself is referential to a previous episode because he said the same thing to Mike. Sure. But it also – it just kind of ties us. We're immediately in the space, in the mm. MST3K space. Anyway, I, I think that the way to bring it home is this. Um, they understand what they are. It's a Kickstarter project that Netflix has taken up. I fully expect there to be a season 12. Um, as you're watching it, keep in mind they did all those episodes, the, the actual riffing part of it, mm-hmm. in about – Two weeks. It's about 14 days worth of recording. That's impressive. That's an impressive recording schedule. Well, I don't think Jonah could control when the movies began and ended either. Well, of course he so, can't. Right. That was why. And, you they know, had to do it so quickly. And they make that joke. Um, <laughs> and, and he said, no, no, Jonah, uh, those special parts were used to make us, remember? He's like, oh, yeah, right, right. And that, <laughs> that's like in the third or fourth episode of the season. Um, they do some fun things with the, the sort of meta story. They keep it consistent. They know that it's a Netflix thing and that People like me are going to be binging this. We're going to be watching all 14 episodes in sequence. So because of that, there's a narrative that's going on there in the background where, where King is like, okay, how are our ratings? And then Max is going, this is Netflix. We don't have ratings. And he's like, well, well, but how are, how are our ratings? And, uh, okay, yeah, they're great. And, and we need our ratings up. Okay, well, let's do a publicity stunt. And so they, over the course of a couple of different episodes, they do the publicity stunt. And so that's, that kind of a thing I think is neat. In the end, I think that they did a really good job of resurrecting it. I was very happy with what it was. There are a few times whenever I felt like they weren't quite um, on par with reading the script. Because, you know, they watch these movies about six times before they sure. as they write them and they practice and they do all these other things. But in the actual take, they would miss their mark a few times, tell the joke before the cue, visual cue came on the movie. I noticed about that a little bit. Four or times, five yeah. times they did this throughout the mm-hmm. season. And um, – that that's just a little too sloppy for me. Uh, I think as they move forward, they're going to fix that. But the truth is, that was always true. It was always true. If you knew you were looking for it, you can find it. Um, so those are my criticisms, and if those are my worst criticisms, they're doing great because they they're shooting for authenticity. They're shooting for the camp. They're shooting for that that realistic cheese, and it's misty. Uh, about the third or fourth episode in, uh, with Star Crash, 
whenever David Hasselhoff uh, is, is there with his portion. light sword. Man, I'm just like I have to watch this one. We're, we're good. <laughs> I'm probably going to skip like, to this one. Yeah, by you the way, really and can't then go back. You can't. And, and uh, at that moment, <laughs> I was like, brilliant. I'm watching Mystery Science Theater 3000. <laughs> Taking about two episodes to get used to the new voices, and I was there. Um, so I highly recommend it if you're a Misty fan. Um, if you've never given it a good uh, like a, a go before, this is a good place to get in. Think of it as like new who. You know, you don't have to watch the old stuff to, to, to see the new stuff. But you should. It's time to hashtag get wrecked with some talk about competitive multiplayer games. So the uh, the nature of sort of modern online competitive games, uh, the type that Blizzard has been making these days, kind of afford uh, new and interesting opportunities to get wrecked all over again. Um, and so I wanted to talk about a couple of the newest updates that uh, Blizzard's put out for a couple of their games that I've been quite liking. Um, first of all, there's Overwatch Uprising, which this is one of their special events. They'll kind of do these periodically, and they'll run you know usually three, four weeks. It kind of depends. Um, but so far, it's been mostly about like holidays, things that are actually happening in the real world. So the first one was actually um, they did their own take on the Summer Olympic Games. <laughs> Um, later on, they did a thing for Halloween. They did one for Christmas. They did one for the Chinese New Year. Um, but now they're actually doing one that's just more about the lore of Overwatch. So you get to actually see a little bit of the backstory, um, some kind of like you know key moments that happened, um, all the skins and stuff that they um, – take with the new expansion uh like whereas before it's like yeah for christmas everyone's dressed up like santa or something like that this time it's actually like you see characters in their states that they were in i guess like 15 years ago whenever hmm. it was um in the backstory of overwatch um and one of the neatest things about this one though and why i think it's so noteworthy is that they've released a pve mode um, they actually sort of run... Um, a PvE mode yeah. for a PvP game. Yes. Interesting. Um, okay. And they, they've stated they don't want to make this like a new focus of the game. They definitely want to stay focused on the PvP. Um, but a lot of people had a lot of fun with the one they did for Halloween, which was kind of similar. But mm. this one feels less kind of like a shooting gallery like that one did. And this one feels more like a raid from Warcraft so, or something like that. Huh. Uh. So before before we go any, go any further, for those that um, may not be as dedicated gamers or as longtime gamers, mm-hmm. we could explain... Uh, PvP versus PvE. All right. uh, player versus player versus, uh, as opposed to player versus environment. Correct. Um, it's a term that mainly comes out of player versus environment, especially comes out of MMOs, mm-hmm. uh, especially multiplayer online RPGs. It's like I'm testing you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, it's going to raise your knowledge stat. Yes. Are you ready? Um, but p- PvE, player versus environment, is basically anything that you play by yourself or cooperatively against the computerized opponents. Mm-hmm. It's not you playing versus other players. And so um, this PvE thing that they added is basically you have a party of four and they have two modes uh one they give you a set of four characters that they sort of it's the canonical set if you will and, and um, you control all four uh you each per, each player controls one okay so like so you're, you're playing with other players yes okay and so it's always been a team-based game right but this one now you're teaming up against just ai like waves of mm. uh, enemies not um player controlled heroes tower defense game got it uh Less more less so than it, the first one. It's, was. You said it was more like an MMO style, so it's more yeah. like a raid. In more more like a raid, right? Yeah. So you're familiar and, with with that, I know. So World of what? <laughs> no. Yes. And so you're um, familiar with World of War. <laughs> yes, I. Yeah. And then there's another mode where you get to choose whatever hero you want, and that kind of lets you uh, mix up different compositions mm-hmm. and see what works well for you. Um, but like you'll go and you'll take a point, and you have to hold it for a while against waves of enemies, and then you'll have to uh, escort a payload to a place, and then you have to go into somewhere. And so what does um, take a point? Is that like capture the flag? Uh, more like a, a zone. Capture territory. A, t- a territory. Like um, territory point, control. Yeah. I, I just yeah. realized point that capture. this is one of the most popular and most often played games currently, mm-hmm. and only one of the background compatible hosts regularly plays it. That's true. <laughs> so I, find that, I just find that interesting. It, it, it tells you something about our podcast. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's for the kids, Jim. It's for the kids. It's, it's for the kiddos. It's a new, new game for the kids. I'm just too mature for that, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, it. that's, that's totally what it, it is. I, know, cool. I, I will say that I'm not great <laughs> at it because I don't play often, and when I do, I always mute chat because I don't have time for that. Um, I don't blame you. Is it, is it like Baron's chat? <laughs> it's well, no, it's just very salty. Oh, because that would have actually encouraged me to go play. It you like you can do chat. nothing. I miss right. Baron's chat. <laughs> I will go on record. I miss it. You can do nothing right, and if you uh, 
don't do something right, then you are a horrible person. And they make sure you know this. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, it's a really cool mode, very well designed, and um, it's a really uh, neat way. Like, I actually got a couple of friends to try out the game for the first time because they've been fans of, say, Warcraft. Mm. Um, and didn't really want to get into Overwatch because they felt like it was a little bit inaccessible. But this way you can kind of get them in and get them, like, to have a little bit of a feel for the game um, and get a little bit of practice with some characters before they attempt the PvP, which I think is um, really cool. So I'm really hoping that Blizzard actually adds a mode um, to the arcade, which is kind of like the... Not the competitive play, not the standard quick play, but just like where you can play like random stuff that they do, including their brawls. Um, that I, I hope there's a PVE mode that you can just access any time mm-hmm. moving forward so that you can have a change of pace. Uh, the other thing is uh, Hearthstone's Journey to Un'Goro. Um, this one is basically based off of one of the environments in World of Warcraft, which was um, this jungle where you have all these dinosaurs running around. Oh, yeah, I remember Un'Goro now. Yeah. That name sounded really familiar. It was great. Know. Um, and one of the, uh, th- there's kind of like two main mechanics that I think they add in this one where the last expansion was a little bit unremarkable. I wasn't a huge fan of it. They tried some interesting things, but it wasn't amazing. Um, this oh, one, was that I, the big party thing? No, that was, um, that was an adventure. Um, the last one was, uh, the mean streets of gadget Oh, right. Where right. they kind of did like this like thirties gangster thing or twenties gangster thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and what they've added in uh, Angora that I think is really cool, first of all, is quests. So each class has a legendary spell card that's a quest. Um, and so they're hard to attain. But it costs one mana, and so you can play it on your first turn, and they always make sure that it ends up in your opening hand. So if you want to, you can discard it and get an opening hand that doesn't include that. But they let you have it from the start. Hmm. Um, and then when you play that card, it gives you an objective. Like, for example, as a warrior, play seven taunt heroes. And then when you do that, you get a reward. Um, it adds a card to your hand that you can then, like, it's either a minion you can play or in that particular case it's a weapon um, that you can equip that then gives you um, a special hero ability. Um, so it's a really great reward if you can manage to do it and it helps to kind of, um, it, it gives you a goal to build your deck around. Um, but it also gives you um, kind of like this, this a little bit of a counter where, like, you have an objection you're trying to reach, the other player can try to counter that to keep you from getting this reward. You also have this other mechanic called um, Evolve. And so whereas before they had Discover with the Explorers expansion they did, um, that lets you, like, when you play a card, there's a battle card that says Discover this type of card. Um, So they give you, like, three cards you can choose from. What Evolve does is it takes the card that you've just played but then changes its stats somehow. So, for example, if you Evolve one of your dinosaurs, it can, like, gain Divide and Shield. It can gain, like, plus two, plus two. It can gain um, poisonous, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And what this does that I think is really good is both of these new mechanics, in addition to the Explorer mechanic that they had before, the Discover mechanic, um, all together this is leading to a thing where you feel a little bit more in control of the game. A lot of people's biggest complaint with um, Hearthstone is either it was too simple or it felt like it was too RNG, too you know random, mm-hmm. um, where if you got bad draws, you're kind of screwed. And of course, you know the pro players would always find ways to work around this. Or, but what it really came down to is the meta of like which decks beat would beat which decks. That's true. Yeah. Um, and so you can only do so much within that. In this one, you can really—I I get the sense—you can really have um, a way of playing. Like one, knowing that it's going to work fairly consistently in the way you want with the quests, especially. It's not just oh, I hope I draw this card that I'm building my entire deck around, and maybe I don't because it's at the very bottom. <laughs> um, but like I know that if I do all this stuff, I'm going to get this thing, and then I can put in phase two of my strategy. So that's really cool. Um, and then the fact that I can now adapt to the changing situation. I see that, that my opponent's playing in this way. So what I need to do is evolve my monsters to be in, like to have these stat boosts, so that sort of thing. Um, so it's a really great way of making the game feel more like you're in control, which is something that I think Hearthstone kind of suffered from. So mm. I think that this is a really great um, new direction. They've also, incidentally, um, started up the Year of the Mammoth. Uh, so last year was the Year of the Kraken. So now they've phased out new, uh, a new set of cards, yeah. which I'm actually really excited about because there were some cards that were in the meta that have been just dominant forever and now they're gone from standard and I'm kind of glad to see that and see how that's going to start affecting Now there's still wild mode where you can play all cards from all time right? That's true. Yeah. So I just don't think that Unleash the Mammoth has the same sort of ring to it though. (laughs) No it doesn't. Well as as the master of the Bracken Kraken I agree. (laughs) (laughs) This is the Mobile Minute, where we share something new or noteworthy about those computers we keep in our pants. This Mobile Minute is brought to you by the Cold War. 
<laughs> uh, I want to talk to you about a cool game that I discovered called Comrade. K O M R A D. It's by Sentient Play, and uh, apparently one of the guys on this team, uh, I guess the lead on the team, was also um, in. in on the team that developed that uh, that computer that went up on Jeopardy what was a big, what was it, big uh, Watson. Big, Watson, yeah, that's the one. Uh, and and so their whole goal is to create games that have actual uh, AI. Nice. And so this is the first in that in in that series in that entry, if you will, uh, of release for them. And it's mostly a hey look at us mm-hmm. kind of a game mm-hmm. um, because instead of having real AI in that sense, it is a game. That is similar to say Lifeline, which we've talked about in the past, um, in that it it messages you and texts you and all of that, but it's not actually online. It just gives you the illusion that you are, um, and it's a computer of that sort from the Cold War, from Russia in the '80s, who is messaging you. And then there's also this little side story about these guys that I don't know. I guess they're mm. terrorists or something, um, and they're wanting you to work for them. I actually don't want to give too much of the plot away because half the fun of it is discovering uh, that you're being messaged by someone who's saying, hey, go contact this computer. He's alive and uh, go get the codes, whatever the codes is, right? Well, um, it's a computer from the 80s. We know what the codes are. <laughs> in, in Sort of intuitively, we already know that. Uh, but the neat thing about it is very quickly, Comrade, which is the name of the computer, says English detected. And he starts talking to you in in the worst, broken, um, bad English that uh, you've, you've ever heard. They didn't have Google Translate. Back no, in did not. And, and basically, he says, "Well, um, uh, I only had one magazine to help me, so that's what I'm pulling off my English from." Oh boy, yeah. <laughs> and, and and that in and of itself is fun. A comrade becomes a really cool character, just sort of out of the box. Now there are chapters to this game, um, or maybe I should say story. And you can get multiple endings, just like with Lifeline and some of those other games that are along those lines. But I don't want to compare it to Lifeline too much, because this game stands on its own, and in many ways is is actually superior to some of those other ones um, in the series, from the Lifeline series. Uh, You know, we've said in the past, I I think that there's a a shortage of these types of games, these interactive games that have, uh, you know, long-form storytelling over a couple of days, and... Comrade really scratched that itch for me. It's a lot of fun. Um, by the time you are done, you have to make some really um, important life or death decisions. And if I had to compare it to something, I would say that it's a lot like War Games, mm. the classic 80s movie War Games. If you liked that movie, uh, you're going to like Comrade. Huh. K-O-M-R-A-D. Uh, give it a try. This week's meaty topic of discussion. Okay, so today's meaty topic, as we alluded to earlier in the episode, um, we're talking about the idea of caring about characters. And what kind of made me think of this is last week, Jim, when you were talking about Nier um, and how you got to the ending and the pod asked you, um, do you want to change this ending? Um, and you said, yeah, I do. And, you know, you were kind of you, you made this comment about, like, you know, why is it that I care about what happens to these characters? Um, uh, why is it that, uh, you know, I care about what happens to them? And so I wanted to explore kind of this idea. I think it's an interesting one of, um, you know, like it's something I think a lot of us take for granted that we can feel a sort of attachment or we can feel we can empathize with them. Yeah, we can we can empathize with them. But they're all you know figments of someone's imagination. Sure. Ultimately. Oh, that's a great idea. All right, so I want to start by by bringing this down to earth and making it real. Okay. What was your moment where a video game character made you feel something real for them? And I'll tell you mine. The, the first time you mean? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Where I have you good really, where you really felt like, wow, sure. this is a thing. You know, um, for me, it was in uh, Fallout Two when Sulik died. Oh. When Sulik died, that's I was, a good one. I was like, oh man, this is hard. Uh, and I and I shed a genuine tear that mm. ran down my actual cheek <laughs> as a twenty mumble mumble year old. <laughs> that's my that's that's my answer. For me, um, I'm actually going to have to go a little farther back mm-hmm. to uh, Link's Awakening, Ooh. actually. And it was really the ending for me mm-hmm. uh, when you kind of find out that your actions have essentially 
made everyone on Koholid Island cease to exist. Mm -hmm. Sorry for the spoilers from a game from 1993. (laughs) Uh, But um, you had this sort of this implied connection with, I think your name was, um, was it Marin or something? The girl that was on the island? Sounds right. Um, And so she no longer exists anymore. And even though... There, there was not any sort of like real deep character um, interactions or anything like that in this game. It was because mm-hmm. it was not that sort of game. Um, at the time that I played it, I was maybe ten years old, twelve years old. Um, it really got to me, and it kind yeah. of made me realize, you know, the power of, of video games. This is before I had played anything like Fallout Two or Planescape Torment mm-hmm. or Chrono Trigger or the Metal Gear Solid series. So I think for me, this was the earliest. Nice. I can't I can't think of whichever time was the first, um, but I think the one that stands out to me the most, and it's not necessarily a character, but uh-huh. it was more like a, a broad, like mm-hmm. across the whole game. But when I played uh, Persona 4, we were talking about Persona earlier. Um, basically, what I, what I came to really enjoy about that game was not just that you sort of build up these um, like relationships with them, that you get to know them over time, mm-hmm. um, but that... In sort of like getting them, getting them to join your team, you explore, and this is like one of the greatest strengths of the Persona as a series. You get to explore their psyche or whatever it is that they're going through. Mm, it's, it's this very right. like they sort of put this fantastic spin on it, but at the same time, it's all very real stuff. It has to do with like struggling with one's own identity or something they like about themselves that they don't like. It, it's all it's it's really all of it is is tied to their identities, exactly, which is kind of the running theme, mm-hmm. but just different aspects of their identity. Mm-hmm. And so between that, you like really get to know people's sort of personal story in a really interesting way but then you also get to keep going with that relationship and get to know them over time i thought that that was um it really like it didn't make me feel feels per se but it was like it ha- it was the deepest experience i had with any um character in a video game before or group no, it's, of characters. It's, it's a good example because we're playing Persona Five, mm-hmm. so we have plenty of examples for that in this game, where you you feel a connection to the to these characters in part because of what they're going through, or things that real people go through, yeah. or possibly people in your life that you know. Like I know yeah. that's happened with me. That I know, oh, this is just like what so and so went through, and mm-hmm. I could really, or sometimes even myself, for you know certain elements of it. So, mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, those, those are all good examples. I think all, all three of us had some good ones, and. Um, yeah, that's something that video games certainly have been able to do. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure we could sit around and we could talk about tons of examples of these this exact instance. But so that's not even the question. That's not even the question. Can exactly. they is not the question. Of course not. Why mm-hmm. is the question Why, why do they or why, or why should they? How, why and to a certain extent how? How? Yes. Okay. Well, I think the how is, is kind of what you touched on just then with mm-hmm. uh, when you mentioned Persona was that you we're relating it to something that, that we've experienced in our real life. Mm-hmm. So even if... Um, Let's let's look at say for example um, the characters in like Link's Awakening that I this is completely fantasy world mm-hmm. they they cease to exist because they were someone's dream mm-hmm. so it's it's not something that could actually happen in reality and yet um, they're presented as oh they're they're people that go about their lives in this village and they have you know the the, the same basic sort of experience of life mm-hmm. that anyone else would um, plus I do think there's an element of um, kind of the metaphor of what does it mean to be someone else's dream? What does it mean to only exist through someone else's conception of mm-hmm. you? And arguably, that's kind of what we're talking about mm-hmm. right now anyway with video yeah. games. In, in kind of a meta sense, yeah. Right. These characters don't that's really... That's a really good point. Right? <laughs> these characters don't really exist, but are they exist only through our perception of them. And um, that's something that when I went, when I've gone back and played Link's Awakening, I was very aware of that. Mm-hmm. I kind of questioned, did the Japanese developers do this on purpose? They recognize they're almost making a meta statement about games mm-hmm. themselves, or was this just kind of happenstance? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, uh, interestingly, kind of a related topic as well, if we've touched on before, is in uh, tabletop role-playing games, the idea mm-hmm. of exo-memories. That I'm playing this game as a particular character, and yet I feel like I have memories as that character. Yeah. Even though yeah. I'm not, I, I know I'm not this character. Because you're, and you're also, and the cool thing about tabletop RPGs is that you're generating what's going on in your head, your mm-hmm. mind. You're using your mm-hmm. creativity mm-hmm. to to see the, the, the dungeon that you're mm-hmm. in and the goblin that you're, like, attacking or something. Same thing applies to, um, to prose fiction. If yes. you're reading a book, mm-hmm. you have to do that. Um, even, uh, you know, you're talking about Link's Awakening. Um, you know, you're playing on a, like, a Game Boy, <laughs> and you, you've got, like, a screen. I'm not sure what the actual resolution is, but 16 by 16 sprites, if even. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is, like, you know, you have people that are contained in the 16 by 16 box, um, it is definitely not like you're not you're, you have to use your imagination exactly for old games. Yes, yeah. totally. You did it. You, even your even mind through like the PlayStation it. era, and arguably to an extent, even in like PlayStation Two, 
um, sometimes some certain areas of it today even like if we're talk we talk about persona um, uh, most of the conversations take place with you know a close up of someone's face and like a text bubble mm-hmm. yeah so you have to imagine their voice a lot of times sometimes even when you don't have to imagine their voice you're still imagining the the poses that they have when they're speaking mm-hmm. um, what they're doing when they're speaking mm-hmm. that kind of thing so it's not the same thing as say watching a movie either yeah. well and we talked a little bit about this in the retro episode but uh, this idea of having memories of old enough games that have really low res, genuinely because mm-hmm. that was the best tech at the time, I don't remember them being that way. Mm-hmm. When I remember playing those games, I remember them in, in call it high resolution, yeah. sure. high definition sure. memories of these low res games. So my original Zelda in my head is beautiful. It's it's every bit as beautiful as uh, Breath of the Wild in a in a weird and twisted kind of way. Because that's, like, I would have dreams about it that night after I played it, that kind of a thing. And so I I think a really important idea that you're you're getting at here is it's not about the graphics. Mm -hmm. But before I set that aside completely, there is a graphical element to this. If I read a novel and I imagine in my head one of my favorite characters and then I go watch the movie version of it, you know, that kind of canonizes what that character looks like. In a video game, you're dealing with that too. You've got the sort of canonization of, oh, well, this is a, um, an Americanized or a, Jap- a Japanese version of an American or something like You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. There's these almost visual stereotypes that come into play. Is it about the writing? Is it about the dialogue? I think with, when it comes to video games, um, because there's more to it than just the video part of it or you know, the graphics themselves, there's also... Uh, the fact that you're interacting with these characters, whether we're talking about um, the PC, the player character, the character that you're controlling in the world, mm-hmm. um, or we're talking about the the non-player characters that kind of surround that player. Um, but then there's also the element of um, sound and music, which I think that we can't we can't talk about video games and talk about um, the impact of of story and the and uh, character without talking about music, because you think of a scene like. Um, well, the ending of Link's Awakening. So do you remember, because I vividly do, the, the way that the music was set up during that scene? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So essentially, the, the, the game itself is presented like Legend of Zelda in the sense of there's always this kind of like um, epic music playing, this adventure music, all this. And it's be, it be, and then, of course, when there's like a – you go into a dungeon, it's a little bit – it's more sinister. But music is is just a way to kind of flavor the experience of what's happening. Mm-hmm. When you're floating in the raft at the end um, – there isn't any music. Right. You just hear the the, um, the 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 seagulls or the birds or whatever kind of like making noises as they fly overhead. That's it. Yeah. So it's this really like profound moment where you're like, oh, it's all gone. Well, it's all, it is all gone because it was just a dream. Almost like all of that epic experience you had was a dream too. Mm-hmm. So I, I do think that that music, whether it's whether it's what the music is playing or when they choose not to have music, you know, that intentional choice, sure. these influence the way that, that we perceive um, the characters themselves, too. So um, That's a great answer. Yeah, and I've mentioned Nier is a great example of this, too, which I think has, um, and I will go out on a limb and say, um, one of the very best, if not the very best, video game soundtracks of all time. Wow. I will flatly say that. Um, yeah, if you missed that episode last that week, good. check it out, because... Yeah, and and I really do think that, and that the the impact of what's happening on scene without that music would be halved or or less. I that mean, makes it would sense. Be so so less, and so I do think that well, just like any movie, really. sure, of course. So when we're talking about um, th- these character connections, I think we have that association with what's the character's theme, what's the music that we associate with that character, and then in in what we consider a powerful moment. What was the sound like? What was the sound like in that powerful mm-hmm. moment? Mm-hmm. And so I do think that that helps us connect because music is so strongly tied to emotion. And that's really what's causing yeah. – and that's really what it all boils down, yeah. down to is can we empathize with this character? Mm-hmm. Well, that's a really good point, the empathy point. Mm-hmm. We're not just talking about player characters here. We're talking about NPCs as sure, well. Sure, of course. So the – That was a- my example. Yeah, the agency <laughs> argument doesn't really hold here um, because what we – could argue is, well, of course we empathize with this character. We are this character. Mm-hmm. It's an empty shell. I'm pouring myself into Link. Link becomes who I want him to be. Yeah, okay, but that doesn't really hold up whenever you're talking about, um, say, uh, the death of a, an NPC like um, Aerith. 
Yes, Final from Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy VII right? Mm-hmm. Um, that was a major event in most people's uh, gaming lives is whenever that happens. That's a good example. Um, another, I noticed you wrote some great examples up there actually earlier. Oh, those are all video game deaths actually. Brilliant. That I wrote and up there, and yeah. the, the boss is one of the most um, impactful moments that I've played in video games right. uh, from, from Metal Gear Solid 3. Um, and I, you've, you've played 3, I believe, yeah, as well, Chris. I have. And that final moment where you, you, you realize why the boss has become, quote, played the role of the villain, mm-hmm. and you have to fight her at the end, and mm-hmm. she's kind of your mentor, and in a sense, almost a surrogate mother to you. And right. you have to fight her, and you have to kill her. You have to. And so the, that moment of it's a boss fight, but you do not want to fight is, for me, it was the first time I'd ever experienced that in a video game. Of, wow. I don't want to fight this boss. But I have to fight this boss. Mm-hmm. But I don't want I don't want to kill her, but I have to. Mm-hmm. So it's this weird disconnect. And then when you actually do kill her and you have that scene at the end where you're at the funeral and she's the unknown soldier and nobody mm-hmm. can really celebrate her life. Um, and you just kind of, you know, have that one salute. It's and I'm almost tearing up right now just mm-hmm. talking about it. Yeah. It was that I mean you could probably tell. It's that impactful for me. Like I just I mean, I was bald. I'll be honest with you. I bawled at that scene. I, I had seen it happen, I'm like, this I mean that just that destroyed me. But a big part of that was, you know, the music that was playing at the time as well. True. Of course. Of course. But, um, but, yeah, you know, I really empathize with that character. And you don't play as the boss at all in that game. Mm-hmm. You play a snake. Mm-hmm. Well, I didn't have that same experience because I didn't play that game. Yeah. And I'm not right. a fan of that series. Sure. But I could easily point to, say, uh, Shadow of the Colossus. Hmm. And by the time you get to about the fourth or fifth or maybe, maybe later, uh, Colossi, and you realize, wait a minute. I'm killing these beautiful creatures, and this is bad. I'm a bad man. And you've got this dark energy that is, by the time you're at the end, there's literally this shadow that's just following you. It's part of you. It's coming off of you. It's like, ick. I don't want to be doing this. Um, And then the main character himself, this is a spoiler, but again, old game. Um, The main character himself dies and sort of is resurrected um, into a baby. But the girl he brought in to to, to bring back to life, she's brought back. To, and there's this whole, this, this sort of equivalent exchange of life and death and what does that mean? And you're not preached at, and it's not heavy-handed, um, but it's very pensive, mm. as Team Echo has a tendency to be. Um, yeah, I, I get you. That idea of a boss fight you don't want to fight, that's, that's powerful stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's the same example. I mean, that's the same example you gave was mm-hmm. you don't you don't want to be doing this part, this aspect of the video game. Mm-hmm. You don't want to take down the colossi, but you have to. You have to because if you because we want to beat the game. That's, that's what right. it, well, yeah. basically it boils down to. But we also want to see how everything turns out. Well, too. we want that closure too. And, and there's there's a certain amount of I use the word agency, but I'm going to use it again in a different sense, mm-hmm. narrative mm-hmm. agency of. This character would need to do this in this context to move the plot forward. Oh, of course. Right. right. So and there's, there's yes. that as well. Yes. Um, you know, there's a, there's a different phenomenon too, talking about player deaths. Um, I could easily point to a trick that Rockstar used. Mm, I guess this was about eight years ago. They were starting to use this pretty consistently. It was a trick that they used whenever uh, L.A. Noir came out and then whenever Red Dead Redemption came out. Mm. Uh, are you th- can you can you picture what I'm thinking, or are you zeroing in on what I'm thinking specifically on character deaths, Jim? Because I know you played both those games, right? And I, I assume you mean at the very end of, of. I think first of all, Red Dead for me is a significantly better game than than Alan. Yes, Noir. it is. Um, and but, I, but they came out about the same yes, time. Yes, and I'm and assuming you mean the final the final part of Red Dead Redemption right. where you are John Marston and you kind of have to sacrifice yourself for your family. Right. And the same thing happens with uh, Detective Cole Phelps. Mm-hmm. And what happens then is you actually play the last level as a different character. Yep. Completely different character. Yep. I hated, hated that part of both of those games. I think that, I think it's really, what we're really talking about is, um, you know, how do we get, how do we get that emotional connection with characters? That's what causes us to care about them. How do mm-hmm. we empathize with them? Um, so I do think we did talk a lot about uh, we talked about you know music the situations that they're in relating to them. Mm-hmm. Um, what other examples would you think, Chris? So I think actually and I want to I want to take this in a slightly different direction. Okay, sort of to to get a little bit meta with it. Um, I I, I want to talk a little bit about and I'm not a psychologist by any means, but kind of like I have a psychology degree. <laughs> but uh-huh. uh, but what it is about just like fiction in general that can make us react to it. And I think that what it is, um, and this is something we've touched on again briefly on before, um, 
and I realized that I, I, I did a misquote last time I brought this up, um, but essentially what's happening in, say, writing or in any other fiction is that our brains, like, we humans are very pattern-driven creatures. You know, in order to survive, recognizing how the world works around us is very important. That's why, you know, we've talked a little bit before also about um, the sensation of fun is when we learn something, when we gain some sort of mastery over something um, that releases a, you know, chemical reaction in our brains that, like, is is, is pleasurable, and that's what fun is. Mm -hmm. Um... And so what we're kind of doing in in fiction is we are tweaking our brains. We're tweaking a survival instinct for fun. And that was was the quote that I had. But it it is, I think it really comes down to our survival instincts. And there's this funny thing that can happen where even you were mentioning a second ago, Doc, with Child of the Colossus, these themes of death and rebirth and stuff like that. um, This is all happening. Like, first of all, the the idea of hunting down massive colossi is very fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, We would, like... We we just we don't even bat an eye at the fact that like you know we're bringing someone back to life and then like being reborn and stuff like that all in the course of five minutes. Yeah, we're gamers. We're just uh, like okay, cool. It was just, it doesn't even occur to us, and I think it's because our brains are able to sort of look for the meanings behind things. Mm-hmm. And part of it too is our sort of cultural upbringing. We understand symbology and stuff like that. Um, oh, we are entrenched in metaphor all the time. Yeah, the shirts we wear, the expressions mm-hmm. we say, everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I think what's happening is that our brains, when we engage in fiction, are kind of able to um, suspend that disbelief. And what we're looking at, is, in a sense, is the patterns. It doesn't matter if like what is being said is coming from. Um, someone that is fictional or someone that is real. It's just the fact that it is being said that's kind of important in that sense, if you see what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, well, and, and, and not, to get, not to get too far into the, into the meta area, mm-hmm. but um, we as humans are – we're social creatures. Mm-hmm. And so in order, to, in order for us to have survived as long as we have because we're not the strongest, we're not, we're not the fastest – um, most physically capable creatures, mm-hmm. we have to work together to survive. So, you know, humans as a success story, as a species, is based around that concept mm-hmm. of um, understanding someone else mm-hmm. so that you can form a connection with them and therefore you can work together in, in, a, in a tribe, a civilization, mm-hmm. you know, a city, eventually entire nations. Mm-hmm. There, there's a part of us as humans that does sort of delights in another human Succeeding in because something. we are social if, creatures, but only but only if we feel like they're on our side. Exactly, right. that's very true. I was, I was about to say the that. reverse yes. is true. That where, jerk succeeded well, where I failed. The, the, the there's also, is true. There's also a shot in Freud where we take delight sure. in people's misfortunes yeah. <laughs> because it's not happening to us. And everyone does that too. And yeah. it's it's that's human nature too. Yeah, um, is is if because we if we feel like they are somehow against us or somehow not on our team, quote unquote. Yeah, yeah. And we see them fail, we're like, oh, good, they failed. Yeah, yeah. But, but if we feel like, oh, they're part of us which these video game characters, we feel like they're a part of us or they're connected to us in some mm-hmm, way. Mm-hmm. So their success is our success. Right. So I, I totally agree with what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. yeah. Totally. And I think there's a, an important point or a little tiny sideline point, mm-hmm. which is that those who struggle with intimacy or have social anxiety, that kind of a thing, done right, I think that videos, video games can teach um, – the language, shall we say, of that. But it also needs to be applied in the real world. And so video games can give the illusion that we have real relationships too, and that can be dangerous, uh, which is why I would never play Persona 5. Um, <laughs> and those who would spend 40 hours playing it, oof, what losers. Point no, taken. You, I, I do think, I do think you, you do make a good point as well because um, I think that's why video games, particularly back before um, video games became as mainstream as they were now and they well, were yeah. a little bit more... Um, Imagination. We don't even have a full generation of, of data yet, right? And and I think that that is that is why a lot of um, social outcasts were more drawn to video games, absolutely, because they could find some way to connect with, um, if not real people or real char- characters, fictional characters, yeah. um, which I think is great. I know that it, it helped me a lot. Is one of the things that has helped me mm-hmm. when it comes to um, socializing. Of course, the other thing that helped me with that was. Actually, socialism. Oh, so, yeah. Get you're a real right. job, it's, adulting and, for and a while. I don't think it's just video games. I think the same right. thing could apply like before video games or people who got into television and movies for the same reason. People who got into books for the same reason. Right. I think or, that's always or, been true. Or sure. take, take whatever case it is. Just like you know, the, the way that you most feel you understand something, uh, just as an example, or like that you can best express yourself as something through, like say, art or music. Um, sort of like the we talked again about metaphor. Um, sometimes the metaphor speaks and rings truer to you than does just trying to explain something. Exactly, and yeah, we talked about that. I think in the in the vein of um, 
of loss and grief mm -hmm. and how when you see someone like say your 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 grandmother dies or your mom dies or something like that and it's it's devastating but mm -hmm. you don't mm -hmm. have this this moment of oh it's devastating you cry and now it's over kind of feeling it's just it all kind of you're kind of numb for a while when these sort of real events happen yeah. but mm -hmm. when you see it play out in a movie or like you know like my example with Metal Gear Solid 3 and I'm I'm bawling over this fake character mm -hmm. Doesn't exist. There's no. There's no the boss. It just. Just. This never. Event never happened. It's not based right. on a true story. Mm -hmm. or, but for me, I was. I'm able to sort of encapsulate that. That feeling of grief of losing someone that was um, a, a surrogate mother to my character. Mm -hmm. I'm able to have that feeling. Yeah. And I think a lot of times, and, and you, you just sort of hit it on. I think a lot of times it's not so much that we grieve over the loss of the boss herself, but we are sort of grieving for Snake. Sure. In oh, that, yeah. In yeah. that case. Oh, yeah. We are, we are sort of relating because we're imagining what he might be feeling or we're relating to what, what he's feeling to us. Mm -hmm. And so it's more that we're kind of, I think that maybe what we're, and this isn't 100% of the time, I don't think, but I think a lot of times what's happening in fiction is it's not so much that we're feeling something, it's that we're relating to what one of the characters Yeah, is again, feeling. it's back to empathy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think empathy is why fiction works. Mm -hmm. I think it's why agency as a broad concept works. And I think it's what we are doing when we engage with that. When we have sadness, we're sort of warming up our sadness drive a little bit mm -hmm. and experiencing some sadness like we did for our grandmother. And that mm -hmm. connection may really be there where we're, we're like no connection at all between the boss and your grandmother, I would hope. No. <laughs> Unless your grandmother was like really cool and, and, and owned a criminal empire. It, but, it, gave it, birth it, on the battlefield. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Invented CQC. But, but <laughs> at the same time, I, I think that it, we can grieve and we can mourn and we can um, do that. I mean, I'm fascinated by these studies that are being done by uh, helping guys through, um, gals too, through PTSD, mm -hmm. uh, battlefield PTSD, by mm -hmm. using video games. And and it's not by throwing them into uh, you know a first person shooter. Yeah. No, it's by it's by engaging them in relationships and mm -hmm. that kind of a thing. Stuff like Persona, actually, cool. if we were going to make a more commercial uh, comparison. And so I, I think that the potential uh, for this still very I'm going to call it baby genre because mm. it is. Yeah. I'm, I mean, video games are still every every time every season something new and, and innovative is coming out. You can't say that about television anymore. No, no. Or completely. movies. There's still, I mean, we're still being amazed, like, to go back to Nier as an example, mm -hmm. of, of its, I do consider it another innovation, another step in video games as well. So it's like, we, we keep having those experiences with games. There's mm -hmm. still so many new things we can do. Mm -hmm. But I do think that um, just what we've learned from our discussion about empathy and, and feeling for these characters, to me, I think that is the strongest argument for, um, you know, games as art. Yeah. Right there. Because if you're that's I mean, that's what art is. If you look at if you look at a painting and you feel nothing from it, you know, you're probably looking at a, a wall that has been painted. That's, that's not right. art. That's yeah. But so so in a video game, to use the same comparison, it's the same thing with, with a film or a book, if it's pr providing you with some sort of emotional response, there's something there that is artistic. Yeah. And that's where the argument comes from that all art is interactive. It just so happens that video games are allowing you to manipulate what's going on on the screen. Sure. And so in that sense, it, it's interactive on a more concrete level. Right. But it But you're right, absolutely right. I mean you interact. If you see a if you see a, a painting that, that um you know really really hits you in some way yeah. uh, you know emotionally, you're interacting with that painting. Mm -hmm. It's impossible to walk through uh, say the Sistine Chapel mm -hmm. and not interact emotionally sure. with it. Oh yeah. Um, now you may not you may not have a profound emotional reaction, <laughs> but if nothing else, you're going to go, wow, that dude was hanging upside down painting with his, his group of guys. Well, that, that's pretty impressive. You know, that, mm -hmm. that might be your emotional reaction, but if nothing else, you're kind of going to go, um, that was a lot of work. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's or, kind or, of or even if you reaction. even if you don't have that, like say you don't know the background at all and you just walk into this chapel, um, I think the the sort of the very sort of physical sense of scale. Yeah. The sort of point. sense of awe and like you sort of look up and it's like, whoa. Yeah. Like, you have to look up. Yeah. You have to crane your neck, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and react physically to it. It's mm -hmm. kind of and, and I think that there's some there's a, a still a, a miscommunication or or maybe a lack of mm, what's the right word here? Literacy 
uh, to, to appropriate that word, with those who don't play video games and don't understand video games, how there could be story there, mm -hmm. how there could sure. be emotional connection there, how there could be that. Because they still think that it's about, um, you know, you shoot the guns and, and, and you have the pretty thing and whatever, wasting my mind, mm -hmm. writing my mind, that kind of thing. You know what? Video games can do that. They can do sure. that really sure. well. Mm -hmm. They can waste our time. They can be a, be a total time suck. And, uh, and, and so can film. And so, and so can books. That's exactly so true. Can, so can any of these other other areas that and, we are. And all that stuff about. can be an addiction. It can. I mean, you know sure. what I'm saying. But what I'm what I'm really getting at here is I I think that for video games to really hold their own and show their own, um, there's going to have to be uh, a generation that passes into it where we um, and our kids understand this, that it's a given video games can do this. Mm -hmm. Then it's not about whether or not they can do this. It's whether or not they currently are. Mm -hmm. Is this specific game doing this or mm -hmm. is it not doing this? And so, you know, I, I look at your boss example. You're the boss example. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm like, mm, I didn't have that experience, but I can empathize with your empathy for having had that experience because of my own experience within, oh, Shadow of the Colossus and various other th properties that I had, the way I felt about Sulik and so on. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's important, is as we're making games and we want to write these characters in such a way that they are um, characters we can care about, we need to look at our personal experience and go, what made me care about characters? Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, I think that's something if it, kind of taking down to a very practical sense. Like, how is it that in such a short time we can sort of convey this stuff that makes us care about them? And it, I think it ultimately comes back to that pattern seeking. Mm -hmm. We got to find the things that we need to include in order to communicate to the viewer, to the player, whatever it is, um, what like logical things need to be in place that I need to know that then lead to the conclusion that we're trying to draw, if that makes sense. So, for example, um, it, it kind of comes down to a certain degree about like round versus flat characters. You actually want a certain degree of flatness with a lot of characters. If they were totally round, they'd be extremely boring because it would be like, um, let 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 me like t let me tell you about my friend so and so and like everything I can tell you about him. Mm -hmm. When what you really need to know is that like he and I hang out and play video games together, and therefore like we like to play this game and we had this experience because of it. Yeah, it, you don't need to know that he majors in blank or that he when he was five this thing happened, etc. Unless it's important to the story. Well, that's true. You know, there's something powerful about saying my best friend video game buddy mm -hmm. because then I fill in the, the details with what. I I consider a best friend video game buddy to be. Mm -hmm. Right. And so as soon as you enter into that space, this goes back to the video uh, aspect that I was talking about before. As soon as you canonize what they look like, mm -hmm. it's like, well, that's not what my best friend video game buddy looked like. And yet I can still buy into that. Mm -hmm. Like, let's say I'm playing a, a female character is the protagonist. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the best friend is uh, also a female gamer, right? So it's, it's two female. I've never experienced that, and I, and I, I never can. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I can empathize with that. I can relate to that because of my experience that's relatable. Mm -hmm. So I, I would push back and argue a little bit with the what's the formula. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you meant that literally. No, I did. I, did. Yeah, no. <laughs> I, I knew you didn't. Mm -hmm. um, be, because I, w I would say that, first of all, it's not, it's not context agnostic. Mm -hmm. What's the story you're trying to tell? Right. Um, what are the type of characters that are already in place in the world that you've created? And then what do you... What are you trying to achieve with the character you're creating mm -hmm. as this, I'm assuming, secondary mm -hmm. character that you want to have the empathy with? Mm -hmm. And I think all of that's going to have this emergent, robust kind of a thing. Um, I also think that it's why we're not going to get to a place where AI or computers are going to be able to create the procedurally generated character we care about. Mm -hmm. Because they don't have any real... Um experiences to fall back on. Correct. Really, any real point of comparison, at least not in an understanding sort of way. That is, of course, in, unless we get to the, get to a point where um, AI is so advanced that they're able to interact socially like humans can. Yeah, and that would be a different story. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a possibility where they can simply analyze the pattern on a massive level we can't even conceive of and be able to um, simulate a human in that way. And then at that point, passes the Turing test, and it's essentially what we're talking about. Anyway. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I could see how, like, I'm not sure we, that's if we had, I don't, see I don't what, know I see, either. I don't think so. But, but you get what I'm saying. I see what you're saying. Yeah. If we had a big enough data set that was designed, you know, by people understanding what people are like, mm -hmm. that the computers can draw from, then, like, say, attach these qualities to a character mm -hmm. and then tell you what those qualities are in sort of appropriate ways, we might be able to achieve hey, something kind of like but, that. For example, like, you know, if 
the, the example like, you know, oh, my, my dog died. Mm-hmm. Um, everyone who's ever had a dog that has died had, can relate to that. Even if you haven't, maybe you've had a pet or something else or something very dear to you. But at the very least, I understand on an objective level that someone's dog dying is a very sad thing. Yeah. Um, it's a very emotional, meaningful thing to them. But it's not always a very sad thing. You can right. have a com- a, like a comedy where the dog dies and it's hilarious. Of course. So it's all I, contextual. And, and I think, oh, yeah, I think yeah. when we're talking about you know, the, the, the AI figuring out the formula or something, which I don't think there, is, there can be there one, is one yeah. I think the, the issue that we'll get into there is if, if they do attempt that would be something like an Uncanny Valley situation where it's so close to being, to being an actual real thing because they've hit the formula. They've hit all those check marks so mm-hmm. perfectly yeah. in the formula, yet – it's not quite there. And so because it's not quite yeah. there, we notice those flaws even more so. Everything that you see is specifically meant to draw out a specific emotional reaction, but it loses the sense of reality because there's nothing that it makes sense. That. Yes. It's a bit like the music yes. thing that you were talking about, mm-hmm. Chris, where if you get a computer to play the song, it plays it perfectly. Yeah, and Nick, yeah. when you wrote in last right. time. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Last that's, a gr- that's a great example to yeah. us. Yeah. Well, I think we've, we've, kind, of, we've kind of talked over um, all the high points, I believe, and we're kind mm-hmm. of near the end. Do you have any... Um, Maybe closing thoughts you want to leave us with, Chris? Yeah, not, not in particular. Um, I would say uh, to those of you listening, you know, if this is a topic that's interesting to you, definitely write in. Uh, let us know if there's maybe a question we hit on but you'd like to hear a little bit more about. We can try to explore that more. We care um, about your questions. Yeah. <laughs> ah. if, if there's anything that, um, like, maybe you've observed and things that um, – Things that you enjoyed and that like characters that made you care about them, kind of who does it well, maybe who um, you found that doesn't do it as well, and we could compare and contrast. Um, definitely get a little discussion going around this because I think it's a much, much deeper topic that bears exploring. Yep. And so thank you everyone for joining us for episode number 99 of the backroom-compatible.com podcast, our discussion on caring about characters. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. And we'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com, and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.